Welcome to Orlando. We're at the GEOASCO conference 2015. My name is Noel Clark. I'm a professor of urology in Manchester, the UK, and I'm joined by Stéphane Houdard, professor of medical oncology in Paris. We're going to discuss uh, three aspects of work which is being presented at the meeting uh, on this occasion. The comet studies of cabozantinib, comet one and two, and then we're going to move on to discuss elements of the reanalysis of JETUG 15, the trial of uh, docetaxel in patients who are homo hormone naive. Uh, Stefan, you've been involved closely with uh, all of these studies. Now, the Comet 1 study, uh, which yielded, which had such great promise at the outset, has been negative. Um, would you like to just start and talk us through some of the findings that are being presented uh, at this meeting? Yes, well, first of all, you know, in prostate cancer and metastatic, metastatic situation for CRPC patient, so far we have so many drugs. We have uh, uh, cabazitaxel, abiraterone, and zalutamine. And on top of that, we have this uh, cabozantinib from the COMET-1 study. And so far, the study is negative for the primary endpoint, the overall survival, which is to buy to my, to, my, to, my, to my point because I think that the drug is still you know, active. Why? If you look at the uh, OS you know, endpoint, you know, we have no differences. You know, the other ratio is 0 0.9. And the study was designed to have another ratio of 0 0.75, so the study is negative so far. And the median of all survival is 11 months for cabozantinib and uh, uh, 9.8 for, for prednisone. But when you look at the secondary endpoints, and especially when you look at uh, bone, bone, uh, bone metastasis you know, response, we have a, a huge uh, difference in favor of cabozantinib, 42% compared to 3% for, for prednisone. So it means that even though we don't have any effects uh, on OS, the drug seems to be active at least at the bone-bone level. And if you look at uh, also biomarkers such as uh, CTC or alkaline phosphatase or NTX or CTX, you have a, a huge difference uh, in favor of cabozantinib. So uh, to my understanding, you know, I don't understand why this does not translate into an OS advantage. So I, I was part of this study in, in terms of a clinician, and in daily practice, I could you know, uh, uh, see a lot of patients receiving cabozantinib. And I think that the main problem is toxicity, uh, because uh, as you know, uh, cabozantinib is, is uh, proposed in, in renal cell carcinoma, in uh, thyroid carcinoma too, and also in prostate cancer. But I think this, uh, these are three different patient population, and specifically in prostate cancer, those patients are elderly patients, they have comorbidity, they have uh, many medications, and they have in a deprivation situation, and maybe all these factors have to be taken into account according to the toxicity of the drug. Well, that's interesting, and if we might take a few steps and, uh, and analyze that. Um, the trial was uh, a really well-constructed trial in the sense that it was large-scale, uh, the patient uh, population was well-defined, but they were a long way down their treatment pathway. They'd had docetaxel, they all had to have ab abiratrone with or, uh, or, or enzalutamide, and a proportion of those had also had cabazitaxel. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the phase two studies, the bone scan appearances were really very striking, mm -hmm. as striking as anybody's seen, I think, in, in prostate cancer. And uh, that's reflected in the secondary endpoints, which show the bone scan responses were really markedly different between the active cabozantinib uh, uh, um, arm and the placebo arm, prednisone, or best standard of care. Do you think that that might have been related to a, a some interference with the process of the bone scan metabolite, mm -hmm. the technetium? I think it's a very good question because, you know, it's always difficult to measure uh, bone metastasis, you know, uh, in daily practice, you know, either with a, a bo bone scan or a CT scan, you know, it's quite complicated, you know. But anyway, in the phase two study, uh, which uh, uh, um, took into account more than 300 patients uh, who received cabozantinib, we, we saw, you know, uh, as, as you say, you know, uh, a patient with uh, dramatically uh, response at the bone level, uh, uh, bone scan. So uh, whether or not it's a problem due to imaging or uh, because we don't know how to measure, you know, uh, uh, disappearance of metastasis or 
Is it due to, uh, to other factors? I, I don't know so far. I think that we, we should maybe have done perform some biopsy at the bone level to see whether or not we have disappearance of the cells, of the tumor cells, uh, but we did not do that because it's, uh, it's painful for the patient, it's complicated. So ethically, it's, it's difficult to, to, to integrate this in, in the clinical trial, but the, the, the question is still open, I would say. And one of the major problems with the drug <clears throat> at the dose that it was given was fatigue. Um, do you think that the dose level was appropriate or do you think that that perhaps should have been revisited? Well, you know, uh, we, we began to treat the suspicion at 60 milligrams per, uh, per day. And I was uh, uh, one of the investigators who, who asked, you know, the laboratory to, to go for a lower dose, you know, quickly, because I found out that, you know, at 60 milligrams, the, the patient could not stand the, 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 this dosage due to asthenia, hypertension, anemia, uh, skin toxicity, hand foot syndrome, and so on. And, you know, uh, as I said, you know, for, for prostate cancer patients, they are heavily patient with comorbidity and so on, and it's difficult for them, really, to have this asthenia, PS2 or 3, due to the drug and not due to the disease and so on. So in my center, uh, I always had to decrease from uh, 60 milligrams to 40, and even from 40 to 20. And at 20 milligrams, those patients could, you know, uh, receive the drug and, and have, you know, daily, daily life, you know, and could, you know, maybe go to work and so on. But at 60, you know, they were completely exhausted. So, and of course, that has an effect on the number of patients who will drop out of the of the uh, the, 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 the trial. Yes, if we look at the common one study, 60% uh, of the patients had to reduce the dose at one level or two levels. And, uh, and about 75% of the patients had grade three, four toxicity, which is very high. So I think it's maybe we need to revisit this drug uh, with a lower dose and to see if we can have the same impact with, with a better quality of life, which was not reported in the COMET-1 study, and to see whether or not we have, you know, uh, a better, you know, uh, uh, tolerability and, and, and better outcome. And that's an important point, isn't it? Because the results of Comet 1 have had a direct impact on Comet 2. Um, now, Comet 2, um, a much more difficult group of patients because they were even further down the disease journey and they had to have uh, really quite high levels of pain. Mm -hmm. And this study has been stopped prematurely um, without recruiting its numbers, really on the basis that Comet 1 was, was negative. Do you think mm -hmm. that that is a wise decision or should we have run through with this really to find out what the effect was in this really more advanced group mm -hmm. of patients as a palliative care mm -hmm. treatment? I think that we should have run through uh, the end of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the clinical trial to have at least you know, some information about pain relief, about narcotic you know, uh, use and, and, and decrease, uh, for instance, for, for some patients. And so far we don't have you know, the, 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 the answer because we could include uh, only half of the patient. Uh, uh, if I remember well, you know, only 108, 19 patients could be included mm. uh, instead of uh, 245. So only half of the patient could be included. So the primary endpoint is negative regarding pain relief and so on. Uh, but maybe this is due to, this, uh, to, this, uh, to the fact that, uh, well, first of all, it was difficult to uh, recruit those patients because, you know, as you said, you know, they are at the very late stage of the disease and they are a painful disease and so on. So, but, but so far, uh, as you said, you know, we have some problem by uh, interpreting uh, the imaging, uh, whether or not we have a bone, uh, 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 disappearance of bone metastasis or not. And as you know, in, in the COMET-2 study, well, we don't have any difference in pain relief. So uh, I, I would be uh, much, much more comfortable to have uh, bone, uh, 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 bone metastasis disappearance and an effect on, on, on pain relief, but it's not the fact in the COMET-2 trial. So we have some, that, some... And that's an important point, isn't it? Because um, firstly, the trial, the COMET-2 trial was a much smaller trial, so over a thousand patients in COMET-1 and, and, and a target population of 246 in COMET-2 recruited mm -hmm. 119. Mm -hmm. um, but 
they were really very late uh, in their disease process. So mm. the patients had to have at least four pluses of pain, so really quite severe pain, mm -hmm. and they were right at the end of their treatment uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. And so one has to ask the question, um, was the trial planned appropriately? If we look at other palliative studies in relation to uh, bone metastases, let's take the denosumab studies, the Zonita studies, they took patients at a very much earlier stage. Mm -hmm. Now, if you and I were planning the study again, um, I would put it to you that we might not go for such a, a hard group of patients to mm -hmm. make it effective. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, co I completely agree. You know, we have so many drugs now in, in uh, uh, late stage disease, you know, uh, uh, that's, you know, they, they propose to, to, to put, you know, cabozantinib at a very late stage. I think it's not a good idea because those patients have uh, 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 bone metastasis, you know, very frequently. So I think it is a good drug to, to, to use it, you know, much earlier on at the metastatic, you know, level for patients having bone metastasis. And, you know, it's so much crowded at these late states, you know, that mm -hmm. those patients, uh, it's very difficult to see a, a, a difference in terms of oral survival. But nevertheless, if you look at the COVID-1 trial, for some patients, the study is positive if the patient were treated with uh, cabazitaxel and if, if they had visceral metastasis uh, in addition to bone metastasis. So for maybe, so for, from a subgroup of patients, uh, uh, cabozantinib could could be useful uh, for in daily practice. But anyway, I think that I, I would like to move, you know, earlier on to use this drug may maybe at uh, either hormone sensitive, you know, stage or, or before the cetaxan, you know, to have, you know, much uh, 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 healthy patient in order to support, you know, toxicity due to this drug. And I will try to lower the drug and I will try also to, in to, uh, to integrate pharmacokinetic study in order to see whether or not, you know, I have the right level of the drug or not. And that's a really important point, I think, because it comes to the question, uh, is cabozantinib dead <laughs> on the basis of what we've seen? And in other areas, let's take the classical trial, which many of us uh, use as an example, the ERESA study in lung, negative trial, subsequently reanalyzed and found that there were subpopulations that did extremely well, mm -hmm. and then almost a, a reincarnation of the drug. Mm -hmm. um, is this going to happen with cabozantinib? Should we be reanalyzing? Because we have got a signal, haven't we, that uh, some of these patients yeah. are responding. So the drug is doing something, isn't it? Yes, uh, you know, like in for the radium-223 study, uh, we found out that maybe if the patient has a, a high level of alkaline phosphate, uh, the drug works better. So maybe we could select those patients who have a, 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 a who are full of bone metastasis with a high level of uh, alkaline phosphate in order to see whether or not for those patients with a drug which targets uh, CMET and, and, and VGFR2, uh, whether or not we have a great impact on those patients uh, who, are, who are full of uh, bone metastasis. Maybe we could you know, just focus on that to see whether or not the drug is really active or not. So, negative studies, but perhaps not quite the end. Now, I'd like to move on to another very important dilemma, um, which is this issue of uh, the use of cytotoxic chemotherapy with dose taxol in hormone-naive patients, because um, we have had a, a great deal of discussion and considerable uncertainty in the urological oncology commu community about how to proceed. Charted has suggested a major difference in outcome, and JETUG-15, in its first uh, analysis and publication, really uh, was negative, despite there being differences in progression-free survival. Now, I know that you and the team have reanalyzed the JETUG data and it's mm -hmm. been presented here today. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could just let us know what the findings are. Yes, so uh, we have reanalyzed, you know, the JETUG-15 based on, on the definition of a high volume of the uh, shorter trial. Uh, so uh, uh, all the center had to, you know, to analyze, you know, the uh, uh, bo bone scan and CT scan in order to to, to calculate the number of uh, bone metastases and whether or not the patient had visceral metastases and so on. And based on that, we could analyze, you know, the study to, uh, according to high volume versus low volume based on the on the charter trial. So unfortunately, the study is is negative, uh, looking at OS. Uh, the, the PFS is uh, 
still uh, in favor of uh, uh, hormonal therapy with docetaxel. Uh, um, Genel Gravis has shown that uh, there is a huge difference between low volume disease and high volume disease, as it was shown, uh, as it was shown by uh, Christopher Sweeney. So uh, this classification is, is robust, I would say, but the study is negative, you know, uh, again. Uh, uh, so we may need to have, you know, uh, more data coming from your institution, from the stopity trial, uh, which may come out at the next ASCO meeting. But so far, it's quite difficult to give you a, a clear answer. Now, one very interesting thing which was raised uh, in the morning session of, mm. uh, of GEOASCO 2015 was the pharmacodynamics uh, and pharmacokinetics of dose taxol in relation to androgen deprivation. This, to my knowledge, is relatively new. Mm. And uh, that is that patients who have had androgen deprivation handle dose taxol rather differently. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, the uh, levels of dose taxol circulating active levels of dose taxol are different in patients who've been androgen deprived. Um, do you think the difference in pharmacokinetic profile might have made a difference? Yes, you know, in the GTUC 15, uh, four patients die, uh, die due to fibrin neutropenia, which, which is a lot, in fact. So, uh, and uh, IDMC, you know, said that, well, we, we need to move on to include uh, GCSF, you know, in daily practice in order to decrease the level of neutropenia, fibrin neutropenia. And based on that, we had no further deaths uh, in this first three study. But anyway, we still have four patients, so it may have an impact on the outcome in terms of overall survival. So, uh, and I was uh, aware about the fact that if you, uh, with or without uh, hormonal therapy, you may influence the CYP3A4 uh, 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 enzyme, you know, and you may modify the uh, area under the curve of the cetaxel. So, uh, as, it, as it was recommended this morning, either you begin by hormonal therapy plus the cetaxel and you include GCSF in order to avoid this neutropenia, or you begin by hormonal therapy for maybe one or two months, and then you add docetaxel in order to avoid this kind of uh, 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 profound neutropenia. So, so far, I don't have the answer, but I think the patient population are different, are different between hormone-sensitive you know, situation and hormone-resistant uh, situation due to this induction of the uh, 3A4 uh, cytochrome. So coming to the key question, um, in France, where you have a negative trial, are you giving, as a, a country, uh, chemotherapy up front in the way that a number of other uh, areas around the world are doing? Uh -huh. Well, it's a good question so far. So first, I think we, we, we need to wait for the uh, uh, Christopher Sweeney you know, uh, study uh, uh, in order to be published, just to have you know, the full data. Well, in my institution, I have uh, five, case, five cases of patients, hormone sensitive, young patients, uh, uh, full of metastasis, you know, uh, liver meds and bone metastasis, you know. So I, I said to those patients, you know, information about, you know, the charter trial, the GTUC 15, and also other study uh, moving on, such as, you know, the latitude study on, on abirateron and, and, and so on. So, and for patient, young patient, liver meds, uh, bone metastasis, and so on, I, I would prefer high, high volume disease. I recommend to use chemotherapy because I'm convinced about the total trial data. Uh, in the GTUC 15, you know, data, the study was not powerful enough to uh, conclude about OS. So I think it's a, a problem of uh, uh, patient population and, 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 and the number of patients so far included, and also a uh, problem of deaths at the beginning due to uh, uh, GCSF. So I would say, for a high volume disease, I would recommend to use chemotherapy, but I'm waiting for the publication. Good, and also with a bit of luck, we'll have some information from the Stampede study, uh, which I think is going to go to ASCO main meeting 2015, and that might give us the casting vote. Stefan, thank you uh, for your insights into the uh, new data, which is presented at uh, GU ASCO 2015. Um, it's always disappointing to have negative trials but we have a clear signal with cabozantinib and it's just possible that that story uh, might not be finished yet. For sure, we have more information to come in relation to the use of chemotherapy in hormone-naive patients. And uh, although the Jetogri analysis is uh, negative, we will have some more data later in the year and hopefully 
that will guide practice uh, internationally. Thank you very much.